gentlemen, boys, and girls, Bite Size Time is here. That's right, we're talking about one segment of Creep Show 2 on Kill by Kill Bite Size. Well, greetings and salutations, Internet. It's your old pal, Patrick Hamilton, coming to you once again from a very cold lake in Arizona. This is the Kill by Kill podcast, where uh, usually we talk about horror movie characters in the order in which they die. But on our off weeks, we like to give you a little something special, a bonus, as it were. And we have decided to take individual segments of an- horror anthologies and talk about them. Uh, basically give you a mini version of Kill by Kill. And of course, there is only one person that I trust that when I feel the need, the need for weed, she'll be there to supply me. The one, the only, Gina Radcliffe. How are you doing today, Gina? I'm shivering. My Mm -hmm. my lips are blue. Okay. I I don't know why I did this incredibly stupid thing. Truly, it is stupid on a monumental level what they actually do. Because if if it was warm when they go in the water... It would be one thing. If the sun was hot, it would be one thing. But from the instant they arrive, everything about it says, don't get in that fucking lake. And they're like, we're too cool not to get in that goddamn lake. And they fucking do it. They do it. Gina, have you ever read Stephen King's The Raft? I have. Yeah, this is in... um Skeleton Crew, I think. Correct. Yes. Uh, it is a very tight, very nasty little story. Mm-hmm. Often left out of the, you know, what are the good Stephen King adaptations? Uh, because I don't know that I would call this a good movie. Yeah. But, well, good. See, I mean, Creep Show 2 overall is not a good movie. <laughs> um, we'll get into that. But the, the, yes. The, this is probably the best of the segments. Yeah. Um, because it's mile. because it's the only one that is directly based on a, a, a King piece. And it is actually, it does actually follow it pretty quick, pretty closely. Um, I would say the major differences are that the, the story is considerably more gruesome in, in how it describes these various college students demises mm-hmm. Uh, and also it ends on a more of an ambiguous note, which I actually, I actually find more unsettling in which yeah. the, you know, you have the last man standing literally because he can't, I think he can't sit down. Um, <laughs> and he's basically like considering just kind of throwing himself into this like you know, carnivorous puddle because there's basically no hope for rescue and he's starting to lose his mind. Yeah. And well, the other element of the, that King story, um, which um, weirdly he had, he had written a version of it once before and it was purchased by a men's magazine in like the mid sixties, like the moment he needed 250 bucks, they paid him 250 bucks, but he never retained his own copy of the story and he could never find the magazine. So, he he kept thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it. When Skeleton Crew was being put together, he's like, "I can, I think I can. Rem- I I remember enough elements of that. I, I should rewrite it." And so it has that nihilism element to it. And the other component that is in the story that they kind of glance at, but again, it works better in you know, when you're being told a story about it, is that the the lake blob is able to kind of hypnotize you. If well, you I, think look the, at the I, th- I think the movie kind of plays that a little bit. It, it does. It, the first, yeah. yeah, that the, the first person who's killed is looking at it and reaching for it. And you're like, why are you, why are you doing that? But it does not, it does not get into her head of what she sees of it. Right. Cause, it. It's, Cause it's hard. It's hard to illustrate that. Yes. I think that's, there's all, a lot of the cooler elements of that King story. They simply cannot, convey in this particular circumstance because they just don't have the money or the time is the other big element of this because the first two segments were filmed in Arizona. The second one they had to film in Maine as part of a deal that, that King had in, and it kind of still has it in a lot of circumstances. You'll always like encourage productions to come to Maine so that money gets spent in Maine. And they, they, they held that off for the hitchhiker 
But their whole thing was like, we're going to go fast and cheap in Arizona, where in the fall, it'll still be nice and warm. And as soon as they started their production, one day in, it started torrentially raining for 10 days in a row. And so they were already behind because they had no built sets inside of a soundstage. They were all practical locations and they were just fucked for this thing. So from the moment the production starts, they are behind hopelessly behind. And so they just start cutting corners and cutting scenes and cutting effects and cutting extras. And it shows because this doesn't feel like a creep show movie. It just feels like any old Stephen King anthology film. It just, there's no part of it that feels like a through line from the first creep show, which has a definite point of view and a definite look. And even though Romero's writing the script, they're coming from King stories and the DP of the first film is the director here. They lose all of the special creep show factors because they can't afford them financially and they can't afford to do them practically because of time. Yeah. It feels very, very slapdash. Yeah. Um, and so um, the other element here is like Warner brothers hears about, creep show too and they're like hey you want like the last one made some money and they're like i don't see this working again i just don't and so the studio that picked them up was was new world pictures which is an independent studio and they're just they don't have the money so they they pony up 3.5 million dollars for this whereas the first one was made for eight so it's less than half of the first film so they immediately cut two of the extra stories one was pinfall about zombie bowlers. <laughs> I shit you not. Um, and the other one was uh, the cat from hell, which they eventually do in um, uh, Ta- uh, Tales, Tales from, from the Dark, Dark Side. Side. Yeah, yeah, that that I remember. That was not very long after this, was it? No, it wasn't. But they had really developed that. Like Romero had written that script, so like it was good to go, but they just. They didn't have the time. They didn't have the money. They didn't know where to film it. They didn't have a location they, for they it for Arizona they, or Maine. They certainly did not have those uh, uh, the Buster Poindexter dollars. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. I mean, when you're thinking about the camp film, certainly where the money goes to is Buck, is Buster Poindexter. <laughs> um, <laughs> a, a true screen presence. Um, oh, boy. Um, yeah, I and, and you notice that no one's picked up pinfall as something that absolutely has I, to I just, splash I just across re- the screen. I'm just reminded of uh, when we talked about um, Deadly Eyes and the mm. the bowling bowling alley scene and how we we wish that the 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 uh, the ball would have come rolling back in with some fingers stuck in the yeah. ball. Already. Yes, oh. I, I had the feeling that pinfall definitely had a scene like that. Oh, for sure, absolutely. Uh, 100%. I mean, one of these days we'll get to Fright Night 2. Um, it's just hard to kind of... Did they ever end up releasing Fright Night 2 on Blu-ray? I'm I don't sure. I, I don't know. I know it's another one of those that's mysteriously hard to find. It's really hard to find. And because it, it like the the people who are ponying up the money, they can't find who actually owns it. And there's a bunch of music rights on top of it. And then you have to pay the people at Montrose bowl where I had my eighth birthday party. That's a big part of it. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, and then the other, the other element is like, even though Romero's writing these scripts based on King stories, they're not actively involved in the production beyond like, here's what we've done for you. And King is writing it at this time. He isn't It's like, listen, this is my, this is the thing I've been you know, aiming towards my entire life. This is getting my priority right now. And so everyone kind of backs off and Romero goes, listen, I have pet cemetery in active production right now. I, I need to make this happen. I've, you know, tried so many times, so many different Stephen Kings, so like this is going to be the big one for me. And Paramount just quashes it. They just don't believe in the project. And uh, like, there's no way this will make a movie. I doubt it will be a good book. And so uh, they walk away from it and he rolls into monkey shines. So he's got his own thing going on. So yeah, um, we have a untested 
uh, DP as a director. He's behind the eight ball in terms of time and money. And out of the three, this is the this is as good as it gets, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say the most notable thing anybody can, can think to say about Creep Show 2 now is that it has uh, a, a young Holt McCallany of... <laughs> of uh, of mine hunter in brown face oh, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> as a, a native American who is mm. very obsessed with his wig. <laughs> yeah. I, um, even though this is available for everyone to watch, like if you have Amazon Prime, I think it's on Tubi. Like there's <laughs> uh, there's tons of ways to watch. I, I mean, you, you will definitely have the phrase thanks for the ride lady stuck in your head for yes. days. Yes. And and certainly like, you know, I'm sure you have uttered the phrase thanks for the ride lady to, to Becky when she has dropped you off somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and she does not know what I'm talking about and has no <laughs> desire to learn. Thanks for the ride, lady. I'm glad that means something to you, Patrick. I'll be back in two hours. Or never. (laughs) Or I'll come to my fucking senses. Uh, So let's get into the raft proper. Um, And we open after that that shit-tacular animation that they're using. I barely barely remember any of the animation. Because, yeah, you're right. There's nothing really holding this together as a comic book movie. Whereas the, the, the original movie had that, that, that old school, you know, EC feel and like, but this is just, this is barely a framing device. Yeah. And those stories are very specifically designed around an EC aesthetic. And while it just, it's one of those things where, the hitchhiker is the one that comes the closest to hitting that specific note of someone who's too powerful to care. And then a supernatural force brings them down to earth. Whereas the f- old wooden head is just a weird, you know, revenge story, I racist guess. revenge flick. Yeah. And this is, you know, four fuck knuckles go swimming in the wrong lake. And what really carries it is that it's ooey and gooey and gross. And that's yeah, why it's, it gets it's, it's basically like, it's just, it's, a, it's the blob. Yeah. It's, it's the blob only like it's, it's not, it's not hiding. This, this blob is just encircling you like a very, sh- you know, flat oily shark. And um, you can't sit down or anything like it. So let's start at the beginning. And uh, we are introduced to four characters um, as they are uh, truly celebrating the best in 1987's public domain rock station. (laughs) There's nothing between this and like music that would have been heard on a radio and uh, during Kojak. It's just... It does not feel of a time of 1987, that's for damn sure. So first off, we've got Randy, the coolest geology student who looks like he should already have a fully vested 401k by now. And then we have Rachel, who's his girlfriend. Now, she could be shy or she could be mute. You decide. I was going to say, I, I I think, you know, the only you know, dialogue she gets is Randy, help me. Yeah. She just does not speak. She just either looks amazed at what she's looking at, or I don't like that. My boyfriend is near this other woman. So, and uh, you know, you got, you crawled in the same car together. I, I don't know what you're getting at. I, I don't know. They all look the same. They all look like they come out of a mold press. All these people. Then you've got Laverne. And I think what, she, in my mind, is what happens when you put Laverne and Shirley into one of those Brundle fly transporters. <laughs> she would pop out. Yes. She looks like she is seconds away from marrying a mob enforcer. And then you've got Deke. Deke is driving this Camaro. Deke looks like somebody named Deke. <laughs> he does. You, know, like, you just go down the list. Like, mullet, check. Camaro, check. Chargers fan, inexplicably, check. 
Um, he's all of those things. He looks like San Diego was, again, put into a Brundle fly machine and came out the other end a uh, college sophomore in Arizona. So um, I was a little disappointed initially because I thought maybe the Camaro uh, was the only character wearing a bra. And then it turns <laughs> out nearly everyone. Uh, and if... It, if you want to get very, very drunk, take a shot every time someone yells out Deke and you will be blitzed. This thing is only 20 minutes long, but people say the name Deke far too often at far too high a volume. Yes. Um, and well, you know, we've talked about the, the many limitations of Creepshow 2 based on its budget and time constraints and just bad luck. But I'll tell you one thing. This segment is dedicated to giving you wiener outlines. If you want to see the outlines of these two actors' penises, guess what? You are in luck. You're going to get the left. You're going to get the right. You're even going to get it from behind. You get it all. Yeah, I yeah, I, I dubious at the notion that they're supposed to be very cold <laughs> because those penises are prominent. Well, they were cold in real life. Because the lead actor actually went to the hospital for uh, hypothermia. The really? Guy, okay. The crew did not believe him, but the director's like, I can see him through the lens, and I think he is very ill. He had to go to the hospital for two days. That's how hypothermic he was by the end of this particular shoot. So, um, yeah, their, their penises fare very well. So congratulations <laughs> to them. They are showers rather than growers, and, and maybe that's why they were cast. <laughs> yeah, uh, everybody's out. Everybody's clothes just leave nothing to the imagination because they are wet and cold constantly. <laughs> With the exception of Rachel, who decides to go swimming in shorts and a sweatshirt. I mean, um, she's the smartest oh, one in the bunch. Yes. Um, I mean, if you're telling me, oh, we're, we're going to go to this lake in October. <laughs> I'd be like, I'm going to bring a wetsuit. Yeah. And it's one of those things where he's like, they don't pull the, 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 ra the raft in until they absolutely have to due to weather. But it's like, but it's Arizona. It's not like that, that lake is going to freeze over. It's Arizona. Yeah. I, I, I think I was in the, in the, in, in the book, it was the story. It's Maine, of course. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Which, uh, or, or it's Pennsylvania. I, it's one of those. It, two. It, it is a, it is a state where it would make sense that they would have to take the raft off the water is at a some North point. Eastern state where cold weather would mandate that you have to retrieve a raft. Otherwise it will get frozen in place and damaged during the winter months. I mean, the whole, the whole point of this is, and as is emphasized both here and in the story is that there will be no one around to help them. Yes. And, and, you know, it, it is impossible to tell how long it will take before someone shows up to, to, to take care of the raft. Yeah. So if someone drowns, if someone is hurt, they are kind of screwed, but Hey, let's do it anyway. We're young right, well, and nothing can happen to us. Their goal is to openly fuck next to one another on a raft, which I mean, again, sure, I guess. <laughs> I mean, if that's your goal, you're welcome to it, I suppose. <laughs> but that's like, as far as the date goes, let's drive 50 miles to have sex outside of a cold lake next to one another. It's kind of like, I don't know, man. That's the, the movie theaters right down the street. <laughs> what are we doing? I mean, do they not have dorm rooms? Isn't that what dorm rooms are for? Yeah, that fucking college doesn't have a goddamn pool. My guess is yes, my guy. But no, they're 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 like, oh my god, we got to drive fifty miles, get stoned, get into a cold ass lake, and then look at one another's wieners. <laughs> I, I, I guess, I guess, if that's what you have to do to eventually come out as kind of by, then that's, that's the journey you're on. That's fine. You don't necessarily deserve to be eaten by a sentient oil slick. But when you see a duck get eaten right in front of you and you're like, hmm, that seems off. When it makes a sort of like strangled shriek. 
as the last it, noise. <laughs> it it might be my favorite sound effect in the entire thing, outside of how how Lake Blob burps and farts. <laughs> It's like, I, yeah, it's like, that's not a sound a duck's supposed to make. No, no, it is not. Um, that duck is just unaware or horny for oil. But um, the thing that I did not remember about this particular segment was it's casual racism. Because there's something severely weird about two white boys constantly calling one another Pancho and Cisco. Cisco. Well, yeah. I, I, that's a that's a Stephen King special because his characters, no matter how old they are, or you know when the story is supposed to take place, uh-huh. love referencing like old like fifties like pop culture, like yeah. you know a college student. In, when was the movie? Eighty seven, eighty eight. Uh, eighty seven. So they would have been like a couple years older than us. Yes. Um, so like old Gen Xers, but like, sure. Yeah. They, they watch the Cisco kid. Why not? And like, yeah. you know, a television show from 1950. Yeah. It was on when they got stoned on their local UHF station, I guess. Um, but just the constantly hurling it back and forth and the angrier he gets when he's like, come on, Cisco. And you're like, stop calling your friend who has a real name, Cisco. There's a blob eating people. The time for this, this little name exchange is over. All right. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I mean, I Deke, Deke isn't, I mean, I mean, do you really think his, his Christian name is Deke? <laughs> oh, he, I'm pretty sure he came out of the womb a Deke. <laughs> I, everything about his nature tells me he is Deke by law. Um, <laughs> But Rachel, after, I guess... Um, on their way there, that Randy notices the oil slick aiding a duck and then yells for the girls who are have fallen who got into the lake after them to swim, swim, swim to the raft. But he doesn't want to tell them, Oh, there's an oil slick that eats ducks. I think you should get it. Like, there's not a there's a weird way thing. to tell there's a that. weird thing behind you. Maybe swim a little faster. Yes. And so when they're all up there. <laughs> Deke's like, why are you freaking out? And it's like, there's just, it, there's something wrong with that oil slick or whatever that is. And Rachel becomes hypnotized by the oil slick. And that's something that's, again, from the book, but they never really make that visual connection here. Probably no, because in the time or money. Because, yeah, in the book, it's supposed to, like, uh, you know, have all these, like, really dazzling colors and and you know it's it's it, yeah it's basically you're mesmerizing you the problem is the budget is so low that it literally at times looks like just a big trash bag floating on the water right and it's one of those things where if you've seen that 88 version of the blob you know how good a blob can work right and it's the, a, and it's the same it is the same like mechanics i guess where it rolls over you and and basically disintegrates you. Yes, dissolves you, as it were. It's uh, some sort of gel-based acid that, um, you know, covers your body and digests you live. And where I think this uh, motion picture sings is once it grabs onto someone, they start melting right away. And then when Rachel, you know, bursts out of the water and said, save me, it hurts. That's where you go like, oh, fuck. You just caught me to the core. That person understands exactly what's happening to them in the sense that I'm being dissolved alive. Please get me out of this freeform stomach in, in a lake. And no one can really do anything about it. And the other thing is everyone is so transfixed by seeing this happen that none of them think while it's eating somebody that's my chance to move right yeah randy does not seem to figure that out and 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 until the end but even then it doesn't work out for him no and but (laughs) we'll get we'll get to that because first we've got deke now in the book the same thing happens the the lake blob goes underneath the raft and gets them via the cracks. 
The thing is, in the book, the lake blob kind of digests him inch by inch. Oh, it's yeah. It's I mean, if you're looking for like, it is pretty fucking gnarly. <laughs> like, yeah, he, he spares King spares no no detail in this very prolonged death of this character. No, because like. Um, he's being squeezed at one part of his body. So like if you took a balloon and you started squeezing one section, the, the other sections expand because it, yeah, all the air I, that I, was there. I, I am I am particularly it's, it's, it, you know, one uh, line that has burned into my brain forever is, you know, after he's been pulled mostly through and is still somehow partially alive Mm -hmm. he like lifts his head up and and i believe the phrase blood starts jetting out of his mouth like a fire hose (laughs) and i'm like it's one of those things where you know if you try to picture what he is describing like your brain's just going to kind of break a little bit yes because you're like god yeah it's they couldn't there's they couldn't do it as a as a special effect it would be impossible to do i well I wouldn't say it's impossible. It's just one of those things. If you had the time, money and planning, if you're a John Carpenter's the thing and you give Rob Bottin a full fucking year to work it out, my guess is you could do it, but to be able to do this on the fly, you just can't. And so you're like, oh, well, what's the other way you can do it is he, he creates a hole in it just, that. Yeah, it, just pull, it, it, just, it just pulls him through the, the ramp, right. which is, which is not, it's a little anticlimactic. Yes. Um, but it does promote the idea that the raft is not necessarily safe because it can still get to them, but it can't make its way out all the way through the slot. It can kind of like reach up to the top of the slot, but that's as far as it can push itself from underneath the raft because the raft is just that much higher off the water. And so there's, there's an established, you know, limit to what the lake blob can do. In a better filmmaker's hands or in a filmmaker who had more time on his hands, you could have made more hay with this. But he just doesn't have the fucking, he does not have the luxury. And so the best you can kind of get is, you know, you have to illustrate that they're really alone at this point in time, that it's super cold. You could have had a great himbo, but now he's just him goo. And you have a giant hole in the raft and you're like, somebody has to stay up and watch where the blob is at any given time. Very terrible day for night shots. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then you get to the point where they are so desperate that they decide to huddle together and then they fall asleep. <laughs> and then I guess he, wakes up. I guess he, the, uh, the, the, the blob's like, hey, hey, uh, you, you, uh, you know, yeah, you know, he wore me up right now. <laughs> yeah, you know, Deke's gone. Deke's gone. He's to- de- totally not going to mind. Deke is not going to care if you get busy. And he's like, you know what? Well, hypothermia and oil slicks do make me horny. So why don't I lay you down while you're unconscious? Pull up your shirt. And start mouthing your eyebrow? What was that move? <laughs> what was the mouthing the eyebrow move? I, 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 he's probably pretty inexperienced. <laughs> oh, I mean, but he, he's like seeing people kiss on like TV and shit. Like this is truly bizarre. But he, he lays her down, pulls up her shirt, and then just starts, you know, like mouthing her hip for a little while, which is very awkward. But then, of course, she is like, mm, uh, mm, what's that? Oh, and then half her face is eaten away because, of course, he's later down on the fucking dock where the lake blob can get you. This is a bad place to sex. It's just not the time for the sex. I mean, I mean, I feel like there is a number of other ways they could just, you know, kill some time if they had to. Right. You know, they could play like, you know, like the hand games that little kids used to play or, or you know, like count stars. You know, maybe yeah. try to name all the presidents. <laughs> but instead, he's like, you're unconscious. Time for me to have sex with you without you knowing. But the blob interrupts. And as such, she gets slicked and pulled off the side. And he's like, this is my chance. I've learned my lesson. 
So he goes swimming for the the shore. And this is where we learn that Laverne has a really great skeleton because she emerges again, but it's very, it's skeleton. It's like, Ave Maria. <laughs> yeah, it does a little bit of the old Avenue three. <laughs> <laughs> we love a good skeleton leap here. Uh, kill by kill. Uh, <laughs> truly, we need to come up with a hashtag for the skeleton leaps. Is it skeleton leap? I'm not, I'm not skeleton uh, hugs, skeleton hugs. Um, just skeleton yells. There's, uh, <laughs> well, well, you know, we're workshopping it. If you have suggestions, we love to hear it. Skelly, you know? skelly yells. <laughs> skelly yells. <laughs> um, so Randy uh, goes swimming for the shore. And I don't know if it's just the fact that he killed somebody via horniness or, because he's such a bad swimmer where he's look, I don't know if he's like looking over his shoulder, but he kind of looks like a, a six year old and the instructor would be yelling at him, put your head down, put your head well, down, the, the, breathe on the side. The, the, it's one of those things where I, and I don't know if they did it deliberately or not, but you know, some certain shots, it looks like they're about maybe, you know, 500 feet from the shore mm-hmm. and other shots look, like they're like a full mile away from the shore. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, I think it's just, lensing is what it comes down to because i'm sure it's not that far but it's just far enough and in that certain angles he's just trying to make it look like it's way longer than you might think um but he makes it to shore and he's like i beat you i beat yeah, you and like blobs like uh oil tsunami How yeah rather, like me now? rather just like you know, you know you're getting up on the shore and then continuing to run yeah. Like a like a normal person, you know, he he is like, ah, 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 I got you, I won. And like, no, you didn't win. And you know what? I'm rooting for Lake Blob. Lake Bob is my favorite character uh, because Lake Blob has done nothing wrong. Lake Blob in he's just innocent. hungry. He's just hungry. I mean, if he I just, if, if I had if I had like swam away from the Lake Blob, mm-hmm. I would be running out uh, out of the out of the water, out of the the you know, the, the, the park preserve, wherever the hell they are and running mm-hmm. down the road and the cops would find me half naked, still running later. Like that scene in Porky's. <laughs> Is this the first Porky's reference we've made on this show? Amazingly. I think so. Good for us. We've lasted a really long time without evoking Porky's and, and this time it, it really had a direct connection. So I think I, it makes think sense. So I think it was warranted. <laughs> um, I, I'm trying to see if there is someone lists what the, uh, the artist is of drive in, drive <laughs> into the edge of time. <laughs> song is. But I'm not hearing it. If no, there's just a bunch of people like I've curated songs that sound like they should be in the raft, not helping. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of drive in, drive into the edge of time. I mean, it's probably like, you know, uh, what was that group? Thor. <laughs> sure. Sure. It sounds like a, a Thor ditty and <laughs> has uh, his tunefulness in mind. <laughs> Um, and then the camera pans very slowly to the right until it finally finds the sign that says no swimming. And you're like, oh, they deserve to die. Well, not for the no swimming, but there are many things that happened during that, that, that 20 minutes that I'm like, yeah, now they deserve to die. (laughs) (laughs) They're kind of dinks and the world's better off for not having them around anymore. Someone's going to find that Camaro. It's going to be the best day of their lives. And the, but, but, the, but then the battery's going to be dead. And the battery, well, you can replace batteries. That's that, true. That's easy. Now you can go down to, to, you know, your local, Oh, 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 O'Reilly's get your ass a new battery. And that Camaro is good to go. That's true. Cause the key's still in it and maybe some joints. How does he fucking swim when those tiny, tiny, tiny panties he's got on <laughs> with joints and a lighter they don't really explain that he's got a special little waterproof pocket so i know is his little his little undies uh, yeah, he's tied something on there but i could really could not figure out the mechanics but it's like i have a tiny case for two joints and a lighter like 
I don't know. You're too smart for football, Deke, but you're also too dumb for life. And I'm glad you're gone. <laughs> Maybe he didn't deserve to die that violently, but I'm not. I mean, he didn't die I'm as violently as he does in the book, though. Yes, he gets off a little bit easier here than. Yeah, than there's a lot, a lot of a lot of bone crunching in the in the, uh, in the in the story version. Yeah, he gets he gets uh, really he's more folded like laundry here, whereas the other one's a bit like getting steamrolled. Yeah, uh, and popping at the you know, having end. having having a, you know just you know, picture your body being pulled through a a you know a less than one inch wide crack in the floor. That's pretty right. much how it happens. Yeah. Good stuff. I mean, we, I mean this, this might be the easiest choose your own death venture we've ever done. Yeah, it's it's slime, 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 or slime. Uh, it just depends on how you want to get slime. So, Gina, I choose you to go first. Uh, I mean, Laverne seems like she's kind of a fun gal. You know, she she, mm-hmm. she had a you know seemed to have a good time. Yeah, I, I I think she got skeletonized the quickest. So you know I'll, that that one would be that that's probably how I would go. I agree. I think she does get skeletonized very fast. Randy though gets all he gets tsunamied in big time, and then yeah, I guess just he just gets I, I guess he just gets dragged under the water or something. Yeah, but you have to swim a really long way. You're kind of exhausted at that point. Um, I, I think getting hypnotized by the slime maybe might make it a little bit easier. I don't know. No, no, because she said that she's one that said, oh, it hurts. So she, oh, uh, she snaps out of it eventually. Yeah. She does snap out of it when she starts drowning in slime. Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's bad. I think I'm going to take that tsunami. Uh, I think that's the way to go for me or the duck. I was going to uh, say, I was going to say the duck goes quick. Duck just the duck a, has one big squawk. The duck just makes then, a little, and then he's 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 out of there. And then he's just Lake Blob gas to burp and fart <laughs> from that moment on. I mean, that's just how rock could end up. Sure, we're we're uh, aren't we all like dust in the wind, aka a Lake Blob farts and, and burps. <laughs> I think so. Uh, so that just about does it. Uh, Gina, where can people find you on these here internets? I write about movies and television at the spool.net. Uh, I also have my Substack, uh, which is Gina watches things.substack.com. And you can find me on whatever is left of Twitter under Gina does things. Do it today, people. Uh, I hope you like the show without guests because it, it might, it might be our future. <laughs> 95% of my guests I we have uh, we have I've recruited via um Twitter and without that tool it's going to be very lonely here on the show. Uh, I've started asking people for emails. Um hopefully that'll happen. Um but yeah, it does feel like it is swirling a particular drain, but listen the best thing about us is you can get in touch with us all sorts of ways. We have a very active Facebook group. Go, go over there. I mean, I know Facebook is also not great, but not actively bad currently. I mean, maybe we'll get back to it. And of course, Patreon, where we're doing all sorts of cool stuff. We have chat by chat. Uh, this month we have a listener's choice where we're talking about 30 days tonight. We're still doing uh Friday the 13th commentaries and that's been really fun. People really like them. So come on over and visit us there. Josh Hollis does our artwork. Uh, Revenge Bonnie does our songs. Go to RevengeBodyMemphis at Bandcamp.com to get this remix and all of the other tunes. Don't worry, folks. The body count will continue. For myself and for Gina. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.